Well, first of all, the Wolfram language has many, many built-in functions which are used for term rewriting. And these rules are located in what is known as the global rule base of the Wolfram language. And those rules are always there. If you're running the Wolfram language, then those rules are available. And whenever you're doing an evaluation, those rules are used when they're applicable. Okay? In addition, now, one thing for the user of the Wolfram language is it's very important to learn as many built-in functions as possible because built-in functions are defined in the Wolfram language in such a way that they are very efficient. They run very rapidly and therefore you want to be able to use a built-in function rather than having to write your own function. So we can write our own functions though and the way we do that is we create them and we place them in the rule base. Now when we do that, those functions that we define, which we call user-defined functions, exist as long as we're running the Wolfram language. But if we quit the application, then the next time we start up, the built-in functions in the Wolfram language will always still be there, but the user functions disappear and you have to re-enter them if you want to use them when you rerun your program. So there are basically two ways to create a user-defined rewrite rule or a user-defined function. The first is to use what we call the set function and the second is to use the set delayed function. So let's describe what that means. First of all, let's discuss declaring a value using the set function. A value declaration is basically a nickname for a value. In other words, for a list or for a number and it's being used in place of the value and the way it's written the full form of that is set square bracket left hand side comma right hand side square bracket or in a more common notation it's simply left hand side equal right hand side now if you notice left hand side equal right hand side is exactly the same sort of thing when we referred to integrals. We were using formulas and when we looked at a thesaurus, we're looking at a word which would be the left hand side and then we're looking for another word to replace it with and that would be the right hand side. Now, the left hand side starts with a name and the name starts with a letter followed by letters and or numbers with no spaces in between. The right hand side is either an expression or if it's a compound expression, it's enclosed in parentheses. Now the name on the left hand side can be followed by square brackets and it can contain a sequence of patterns or label patterns. And the right hand side can contain the labels, but it doesn't contain any of the blanks. So let's see what we're talking about here. Let's consider the following two set functions. A is equal to the list minus one, one. When we enter that, what we get back is the right hand side minus one, one, the list. The next example is rand one equals random integer one and two, which means what we're just doing is we're saying that rand one is a random integer between one and two, and the answer we get back is two. The important thing to notice is that when we enter a set function, that means we enter a is equal to the list minus one, one, or we enter rand one is equal to the random integer between one and two, then the value is returned from the evaluation of the right hand side. So if we look at the global rule base to see what the rewrite rule is that we've just entered, what we find out, we ask what is a, and it tells us that a is equal to minus one, one. So we've now, as soon as we evaluated a is equal to minus one, one, that goes into the global rule base. And whenever it sees a, when it's evaluating an expression, it's going to replace it with that list minus one, one. If we enter and ask, what is the value of rand one? Notice that what we get back is the number two. We don't get back random integer one, two, but instead we get back the result of evaluating 
the random integer between 1 and 2. In other words, the right hand side has been evaluated, but the left hand side has not been evaluated. It's very important that the left hand side not be evaluated, and we'll show you why now. If we look at the attributes of set, it has the property that it holds first. And hold first means that the first argument to the function is left unevaluated. And the reason you want to do that is shown here. If I write set a comma 6, I get back 6. And if I ask what is a, it goes to the global rule base, it looks it up, and it says, oh, a is 6. Now let's look at what happens if we don't require that the set function not evaluate the left hand side. What if we say that the set function can evaluate the left hand side? Well the way we do that, and this is something you don't want to do normally, you don't want to mess with the values of the built-in functions because that can cause all kinds of havoc. But for the purposes of illustration, we're going to say that we're going to allow the left hand side of the set function to be evaluated. And we do that by writing clear attribute set hold first. So now when we write the attributes of set, notice that we no longer have the fact that it has hold first. So then when we write set a comma 7, we get back an error message. Because what's happened here is in the evaluation, it evaluated a to be 6. And what we're trying to do because we're not holding the left hand side unevaluated, we're trying to set 6 equal to 7. And that of course makes no sense and the Wolfram language tells us no you can't assign anything to the value of 6 because 6 is an atomic expression and you can't do anything with it. So when the right hand side is a compound expression enclosed in parentheses, the expressions on the right hand side are evaluated in order from left to right and the right hand side is the result of the final evaluation. So we'll look at the example of RAN2. RAN2 is given by the compound expression b is equal to the list minus 1 1 semicolon random real number b. And what we get back when we enter that is minus 0.642186. And when we ask what RAN2 is, what has been placed in the global rule base, we get minus 0.642186. What's happened here is that in the evaluation of RAN2, B was first evaluated to give the list minus 1, 1. Then when we evaluated random real B, that list B equal minus 1, 1 is placed in the global rule base and it's used in evaluating random real so we're really evaluating a random real number between minus 1 1 which happens to be minus 0.642 and that's been placed in the global rule base. So it's really important that when you write the right hand side that the expressions you use that are separated by semicolons appear in the correct order. Let me give you an example. If I write rand3 equal random 3 c semicolon c equal the list minus 1 1 what we get back is an error message followed by minus 1 1. So what's happened is in the evaluation process the Wolfram language is trying to evaluate random real c but random real doesn't allow you to use a symbol as an argument. It makes no sense. It has to be uh, given an interval to choose a number from. So that's why it's not evaluated and you get an error message. But once it does that, it goes on to the next expression which is c equal the list minus 1 1 and it does the evaluation and enters it into the global rule base. So when we look in the global rule base and we ask what's RAN3, it gives us back that RAN3 is equal to minus 1, 1 because that's the last thing that happened when we evaluated the right hand side. If we ask what C is, it tells us that C is the list 
minus 1, 1. So when a set function is entered, both it and any set functions or set delayed functions on the right hand side create rewrite rules as it's being evaluated. And those rules are put in the global rule base and then they're used whenever it's appropriate. And we can see that if we ask what is B and we ask what is C, we get that B is the list minus 1, 1 and C is equal to the list minus 1, 1. After a value has been declared by entering a set function, the appearance of the value's name during an evaluation causes the value itself to be substituted in. That's why we say that it acts like a nickname. For example, when I put in absolute square bracket ran2 in the evaluation, the Wolfram language looks to see if there's a rewrite rule for ran2. Well, we previously did an evaluation of RAN2 and we got minus 0.642186 so that's now substituted into the input 64 and it's asking us to take the absolute value of minus 0.642186 which is positive 0.642186 okay one of the things we do want to note is that as we see above it's possible to have the same right hand side given different nicknames. So we can call the list minus 1, 1, B, or we can call it C. So there's no problem if you have the same right hand side appearing with two different left hand sides. Now, it's important to note that the left hand side of a rewrite rule can only be associated with one value at a time. When the set function is entered, the resulting rewrite rule overwrites any previous rewrite rule we might have. Let me give you an example. We're going to enter the expression ran4, which is the random integer between 1 and 2. And if we ask, well, okay, we've done that, it's been entered, what is the value of ran4 in the global rule base? We get 2. Because what's happened is the right hand side random integer 1, 2 has been evaluated and it came up with the answer 2. If we now re-enter ran4 equal random integer 1, 2, it's, the right hand side is evaluated and in this one particular case it gave the value 1. So now if we ask what's the value of ran4, we get 1. What we see is that the value of ran4 was 2 when we first entered it and this value was subsequently changed to 1 when we re-entered it. Now while the right left hand side of a rewrite rule can only be associated with one value at a time, a value can be associated with several names simultaneously. And we've already done that before when we basically defined b to be the list minus 1, 1 and we also defined c to be the list minus 1, 1. Now, when we have a user-defined rule, we sometimes want to remove it from the rule base. The way we do that is by using one of two commands. The first command is the word clear, and if we enter clear b, and then we ask what b is, we see that it no longer has the value, the list minus 1, 1. It just says, well, b is a just a global value b. If we do remove, it not only removes the definition of C, it actually removes the symbol itself, so it's not even there. So remove is a much more drastic way to clear a rewrite rule that we've defined than clear does. Okay, that's how we define set functions. Right, well, so far we've described how one creates a set function and places it into the global rule base. Now we'll turn to talking about a set delayed function. And a set delayed function is defined as shown here by the left hand side consisting of a name where the name is followed by a set of square brackets uh, containing a sequence of labeled patterns which are of course just um, symbols ending with one or more underspaces. So it could be a blank or a double blank or a triple blank and the use of the name is because they represent dummy variables. Um, 
And basically then the right hand side is either an expression or a compound expression which is enclosed in parentheses and it will have the labels that are on the left hand side on the right hand side but without any blanks. So let me give you an example and show you how that works. It's a set delayed function f of x blank colon equal random real zero to x and so what we're doing is we're creating a function of x which is a random real number between zero and x where we would specify x when we want to use that um, function. So let's enter that and the first thing that we notice is that when we enter the set delayed function into Wolfram language that we don't get anything back. If you recall when we created a set function um, the right hand side of the set function was evaluated and then the result was returned as output. So um, if we look at the set delayed function once we've entered it even though we don't have any output we find if we look at the global rule base that in fact there it is it's now been entered so that that can be used when we evaluate any other expression in the Wolfram language. Now the one thing to note is that as I said not only is the left hand side of the set delayed function not evaluated but for a set delayed function the right hand side is not evaluated either and that's what makes it different from a set function where you don't evaluate the left hand side but you do evaluate the right hand side. So the fact is that we don't evaluate either side of a set delayed function and so the property is called hold all that we have and if we look up attributes for that set delayed function we find that that's what it means. Uh, if you recall when we talked about the set function it had hold first which basically meant that the first argument wasn't which was the left hand side of the set function wasn't evaluated and we gave you an example of why we would want that to be done that way. So let's say we've now entered um, f of x blank um, equal a random real number between 0 and x and it's in the global rule base now we can use that. So we can enter for example f of 8 and what we get back is a value and what's happened is that when we put in the left hand side with a particular value with a particular argument value then the right hand side of that set delayed rule is evaluated using the input value. In other words this will evaluate a real number between 0 and 8 and in this case it happens to be 0.791243. Now if we now enter f with the same argument we don't get back the same answer but the right hand side instead is reevaluated freshly. It's never, as though it were never evaluated before and in this case it happens to calculate the value 3.20796. So in contrast to the set delayed function, the set function only evaluates the right hand side when it's first entered and thereafter whenever you enter the left hand side you're going to get back the exact same evaluated right hand side because the global rule base has entered that evaluated right hand side into the rule base. Okay, but as I said in the case of a set delayed function since it's not evaluated neither the right nor the left hand side then when you call it again it has to reevaluate. Let me show you why that's important. Here's the set function f of x is equal to x. Now we enter that and then we go to the global rule base and we say hey do you have any rewrite rules for the function f and it comes back and it says yes we have f of x blank equals x. So for example if we enter f of 9, 9 is our argument, what we get back is 9. And if we enter f of 7 then what we get back is 7. Okay so that seems to work perfectly okay. But look at what happens if the right hand side of the set function has a value before we enter the set function. What do we mean? Let's say we write y is equal to 7 and we just enter it. And it goes into the global rule base and as you know anything in the global rule base is used whenever an expression is evaluated and if there is a rewrite rule 
for what you enter already in the rule base, it uses that. So for example, if we first enter y equals 7, so that now becomes part of the global rule base, and then we enter g of y blank equals y, we get back that g of y blank is equal to 7. Notice, on the right hand side, we get the value 7. Now, if we enter g of 3, if you looked at the set function, g of y blank equal g, what you might expect is that g of 3 would give back 3. But in fact, it gives back 7. Why does it give back 7? Because we already have a rule that we've previously entered into the rule base, which is that y is equal to 7. Well, clearly, then that would be a really terrible function to define because I can enter g and I could put in anything I wanted. I could put g of, let's say, dog. I use the symbol dog. I would get back 7 <laughs> because 7 is in the global rule base and it's immediately used. And that's why when you write a program that you want to run with different input values, what you do is you don't create a set function, but you create a set delayed function. So that's how you define a function or a program in the Wolfram language. And here's an example of it. Here I set z is equal to 8, and then I write a set delayed function g of z blank equals z, and I look in the global rule base and notice that I have entered into the global rule base g of z blank colon equals z, which as I said earlier when we were discussing the set function, that z would have been evaluated and it would have returned, when I asked what g is, it would have returned g of z blank colon equal 8, which would be ridiculous because we wouldn't want to use it that way. Okay, now when I enter now g of 2 with a different argument, now again it goes and it uses the rule in the rule base which has an unevaluated right hand side so g of 2 gives 2 which is what you would want it to do. Okay so this property is the property of fresh evaluation and that's why you use the set delayed function to define a program. Now when the right hand side of a set delayed function is a compound expression which means it consists of a number of expressions that are separated by semicolons, then there are no rewrite rules that are entered from any functions you define from the right hand side when the function is entered. It's only used once the function is called. And let me explain what that means with an example. Let's define a set delayed function g of x and then the right hand side has d is equal to 2 semicolon x plus d. I enter that, I go to the global rule base, and I say, hey, do you have a rule for the symbol g? And it gives back the set delayed function that I just defined. Now, on the right hand side, notice that d is equal to 2, so I can say, well, do you have a rule for, for d? Well, it turns out when you do that with a set delayed function, you don't get back a value. You don't get back d equal 2. Why don't you get it back? Well, the reason is that the right-hand side was never evaluated. So d equal 2 was never actually evaluated when you entered the set delayed function, so it's not in the rule base. All right? But the first time you run the function you've just defined, so for example, I put in g of 3, what it will do is it will say, it first say d is equal to 2, and then it will evaluate x plus d, and it'll substitute in for d the value 2, and so you get back 5. And that's why g of 3 is equal to 5. Now we go to the global rule base and we say, well, now do you have a value for d? Do you have a, a rewrite rule that I can use? And it says d is equal to 2. So in other words, when you enter a set delayed function, if you have other rules that are defined, within the right hand side of the set delayed function, those rules are not entered into the rule base until you run the program or you put in the, the function and evaluate it. And at that time, any function that's on the right hand side is evaluated and goes into the rule base. Okay? Now, 
we can put constraints on our rewrite rule. The way we do that is by attaching constraints either to the left hand side or the right hand side of the rule. For example, conditional pattern matching with blank H or with blank question mark or with blank slash semicolon can be attached to the dummy variable arguments on the left hand side. Also you can replace um, the slash semicolon on the right hand side immediately after the right hand side expression. So let me show you how that works. Here we're going to create a set delayed rule. S where the argument is S of X is equal to the square root of X but I'm putting a condition on X and that is that the argument I use with S has to be an even integer. So when I enter S of 6 I get back a value. It's taken the square root and the reason um, I have an N in the definition is um, so that it actually evaluates it as a real number. Okay. Now if I enter S of 5 what I get back is S of 5. Now notice two things. The first is that it didn't use the rule that I defined at the very top that s of x blank question mark even q. It didn't use the right hand side. Um, why? Well because 5 isn't an even integer so it didn't satisfy the requirement for using the rule. So a lot of people, you'll hear this very often, who are writing um, entering something in the Wolfram language well, they'll say, I made an entry and nothing happened. Well, in fact, something did happen. What happened is the Wolfram language evaluated what you entered, but didn't make any change because you didn't have a rewrite rule in the global rule base that it could use to make a change. So while it looks, in the example here, S of 5 returns S of 5, it looks like S of 5 was never evaluated, in fact, it is evaluated, but there's nothing, there's no rule for it. So it didn't change anything. Okay? Now, as we pointed out, when the left hand side of a set function or a set delayed function is evaluated, and that occurs when you first enter the set function, and it occurs when you first run or evaluate the set delayed function, then the rewrite rules for all the functions defined on the right hand side into the rule base. And this can cause a problem if the name is used elsewhere in a program. And we actually saw that happen when we try to use a set function, first letting y equal 7 and then using g of y blank equal y that gave us 7. So it was, it was being used. And that's a problem. So the way we do that is we can insulate a name clash. And the way we do that is by using something called the module function. And let me show you how that works. What we do is we write the left hand side colon equal because it's a set delayed function and then all of the names that we want to be localized we put in parentheses as the first argument to the module built-in function. And then we have the rest of the function which is the right hand side. Now the names that are entered here on the right hand side are all local. What that means is they're not in the global rule base. They're not in the global rule base when you enter that function definition, but they're also never in the global rule base even after you've run the program, which is different than a normal set delayed function. If you don't localize those names when you first run the program, the evaluation of any expression on the right hand side goes into the global rule base but by localizing it using the module function we can prevent that. So here's an example. I define t of y, which means t with an argument y blank, colon equal to module of m, m is equal to 2, and then y plus m. So if I ask is there a value of m in the global rule base that I can use, well of course there isn't because the right hand side was never evaluated. So now I enter t with a particular argument, let's say 3, what it does is it first uses m is equal to 2 and then it takes the argument y, which in this case is 3, and it adds 2 and it gives you back 5. Now if we ask, well now we've done the evaluation of that function, 
is m equal 2 in the global rule base, we find out that, in fact, it's not. And the reason is because we use the module and we localize the name so that, in fact, that value, that set function that we have on the right-hand side is only existing, in a way, when you actually run the function. It doesn't exist in the global rule base outside of the function that you just defined. Okay? Now, when the left-hand side of more than one built-in function or one user-defined function or rewrite rule pattern matches an expression, um, the choice of which rule you're going to use is determined by what we call the order of precedence. And the rule is this. If you have a rule that has the same name, one of which comes with the Wolfram language, it's a built-in function, and you have another function which you've defined with the same name, but it's your name, it's one you've created with using the set function or the set delayed function, then when the Wolfram language does the evaluation of your expression, the first definition it uses in the rule base is the one that you created. In other words, user-defined rewrite rules are used before built-in rewrite rules. Okay? And then in general, the Wolfram language will use a more specific rule before a more general rule. And we saw this at the very beginning of the lecture when we talked about looking for a pattern match to an integral. And we showed that there were, what were there, three or four possible pattern matches to the integral of x squared um, dx between 0 and 1. And basically the, we said that the Wolfram language will use the most specific pattern match that it can find because that's the less work that you have to do, so to speak. And that's the way it works um, with the rewrite rules that you create. More specific rules are used before more general rules. So for example, I'm going to put in two definitions of f of x. Well, the first one is that f of x is equal to x squared. And the second one is f of x, where x is an integer, is equal to x cubed. So we look into the rule base and we say, hey, do you have any rewrite rules, any definitions of f in the rule base? And we get both of them. Well, why do we get both? Notice that the left-hand side of those two rules are not identical. One of them says any value of x can be used as an argument. The other one says, well, that rule only works when x is an integer. Why can't you have two rewrite rules that have the identical left-hand side? Well, the reason is because then the Wolfram language, you enter f of x, let's say, it wouldn't know which rule to use. It would have multiple choices. So that would completely confuse everybody, and it would certainly confuse the Wolfram language. So you never have two left-hand sides that are identical in the rule base. They can be the same type, but they have to have different specificities. So let's show that. We're going to enter f with a real valued argument. So we'll enter f of 6 and we'll use a decimal place, decimal point, in order to say it's a real number, and we get back 36. Now, if we enter f of 6 and we use 6 as an integer rather than as a real number 6, we get back 216. What's happened? Well, if we look back here, when we entered f of 6, the real number 6, there was only one rule that fit. The first rule, f of x, where x is an integer, doesn't fit because 6 decimal point is not an integer. It's a real number. So it has to go to the second rule, and it uses f of 6. And it gives us x squared, and that's why you get 36. Now, when you enter f of 6, where 6 is an integer, not a real number, it looks at the rules, and as I said, the Wolfram language always uses the most specific left-hand side that it can. It tries to maximize the specificity of the pattern matching. So it looks and it says, well, f of x, 6 is an integer, will match both of those definitions. But the first definition says that x has to be an integer, while the second definition doesn't require it. Therefore, the first definition is more specific. So the Wolfram language uses that rule first because it's the more specific rule and therefore it takes 6 the integer and it cubes it. 
And that's why you get 216. Okay? So that's what I've said here, is that it occurs because while an integer valued argument pattern matches both x blank and x blank integer, so it pa pattern matches both rewrite rules, the second rule is more specific, and that's why it returns an integer. Now, the one problem you can have is that the Wolfram language in the rule base can't tell which rule is more specific than another, which is more general than another. When that happens, it uses the rules in the order in which you've entered them into the rule base. Okay. Now, if you want, it is possible to go in and actually change the order of the rules so that if you have three rules, let's say one would say f of x integer and the other one would be f of x real, those are both equally specific. One requires an integer and one requires a real number. They're both equally specific, but you want, when there's a choice, you want the Wolfram language to always pick the real number. But the way you've entered it, the integer went in, definition went in before the real number definition went in. And that's not gonna help you, but you are able to, in the Wolfram language, go into the global rule base and reorder the rules to make the one appear before the other, so that will be the first one that's used. Okay, now, here's an example of that. Here I have w of x is equal to x to the fourth power, and here I have w of blank equal to a real number, and that'll be a real number between zero and one. And when I enter w of two, well, I get back 16. So what's going on here is that w of two, when it's being evaluated, goes to the global rule base, it looks, and the two things I've just entered, one says w of x blank, and the other one just says w of blank, those are equal specificity. Remember, I said that when you give a label to a blank, it doesn't change it, it's just a way of being able to refer to that particular blank, okay? So those are equal specificity, and in this case, w of two, it picked the first one in the rule base, which happens to be x fourth. So it takes two and it takes it to the fourth power, which is 16. And you can see that if you look in the global rule base, that is the first one that appeared. Okay, well, we've talked about rewrite rules that go into the rule base. Those are set functions and set delayed functions. But sometimes we wanna have a rule that doesn't go into the global rule base at all, but is only used for evaluating a very specific expression. So we wanna keep it away from the rule base so that it's not used for pattern matching. And the way we do that is we use what's called a transformation rule. And that's done using what's known as a built-in replace all function or a rule or rule delayed function to create a transformation rule. And let me show you how we do that. A rule function can be attached by writing whatever expression you want, slash dot, and then left hand side arrow, right hand side. And the left hand side can have symbols, it can have numbers, it can have labeled patterns, it basically can have anything that you want in it. And when you enter an expression with an attached rule, then the expression is evaluated first. After the expression is evaluated, then you evaluate the left-hand side of the rule and you evaluate the right-hand side of the rule. Once you've done that, you have an evaluated expression, you have an evaluated left-hand side, and an evaluated right-hand side. Then, finally, you can use that evaluated left-hand side in the evaluated expression and replace it with the evaluated right-hand side. Let me show you what that means by an example. First, let's clear A because we just want to get rid of it in case we've accidentally put A in the rule base. We don't want to be pulling it in the middle of our rules, so we have to clear it out. And here's an example. I have table one, four. That means I want a table of one. It's basically a list of four ones. And the transformation rule is then a random integer between zero and one goes as A. Okay, and what I get back is A, A, A. So what's happened here is first, the expression 
create a table of four ones is created and then it evaluates the left hand side of the rule and it happens in this case to pick one and it says and then it evaluates A and remember A has nothing attached to it because we cleared it and it basically then creates from table 1-4 with the, with the um, transformation rule random integer 0 to 1 A it creates 1 1 1 1 where 1 goes to A and then after we've done that it does the rest of the evaluation and it converts it all to A's okay here's another example where I do the exact same operation and I get back all ones well why didn't it go to A's because after I created the list of four A's when I went to the left hand side of the transformation rule instead of pulling up a one as I show here it was zero and then all the zeros get converted to A's but my list doesn't have any zeros in it so there's no rule that says change your one to anything else so that's what you get back as an answer okay here's another case where I write a random table so I'm creating a list of ones and then my transformation rule is that some random integer between 0 and 1 which means either 0 or 1 chosen randomly goes to either the first part of the ordered pair AB which would be A or the second part of the ordered pair AB which would be B and it does so where the, the part that you pick is done randomly so when we enter this we get back B B B so what's happened is first we've evaluated the expression and that creates a list of four ones then we evaluate the left hand side of the transformation rule and in this particular case it happened to pick one so the left hand side of the transformation rule becomes one and then it evaluates the right hand side of the transformation rule and in this case it's picked out the second part of the ordered pair AB and so we now have the list 1111 where 1 is replaced by B and so in the evaluation process wherever it sees a 1 it replaces it with B and that converts our list of four 1's into a list of four B's now let's do that again just to show what could happen in this case I'm entering the exact same expression but after I created my list of four ones by evaluating the expression when I went to evaluate the left hand side of the transformation rule instead of pulling up a one it pulled up a zero so now the transformation rule is zero goes to and here I picked the evaluation of the right hand side and it's picked the first component of the ordered pair so I have one 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 where zero goes to a which of course is just 111 because the transformation rule doesn't work there is no replacement for 1 there's only a replacement for 0 now here we'll look at an, yet another case where I do the, exactly the same thing but in this case when it did the evaluation of the left hand side of the transformation rule it picked 1 rather than 0 so now after having evaluated the expression table 1 which is a list of four ones it now uses the transformation rule one goes to A and we end up with all A's now we not only can have one transformation rule we can have a whole bunch of them and the way we write that is we write the expression with a slash period followed by the various transformation rules that we have each separated by a comma so if we look at ABC where we use a transformation rule C goes to B and B goes to A what we end up with is AAB now how did that happen all right we enter A the list ABC and Wolfram language goes to evaluate that well we don't have A B or C defined in the rule base in this case so it looks around at the transformation rules and it says well I don't have any transformation move for changing A to anything so we'll just keep it as an A then it goes to B and it says 
Um, do I have a rule, a transformation rule for changing B? And well, yeah, here's one. It's the second rule. It says that B becomes A. So here we see that the B has been turned into an A. Now we get to the C and we say, is there a transformation rule for C? Well, there is a transformation rule. It says that C goes to B. But what could happen is after you turn C into B, it could look again at the transformation rules and say, hey, do you have a rule for changing B? And we do. It's B goes to A. But notice that it hasn't been changed. And the reason is that when you apply a transformation rule or a series of them, they're applied in parallel. So once you've done a transformation of the evaluated expression using any transformation rule on the right hand side, that's it. It doesn't keep changing. It changes one time. So only one transformation rule at most is ever applied to a given part of an evaluated expression. And then after that, no more are used. Okay. Now let's talk about using the set, the rule delayed function. Okay. A rule delayed function is very similar to a rule function, except instead of an arrow, we have a colon arrow. And the way this works is we can use it first of all with a single uh, rule delayed function, or again, we can have a whole bunch of them on the right hand side. And the left hand side of each transformation rule can be written as before using symbols or numbers or labeled patterns. Okay. Now, when we do an evaluation, what happens is first the expression is evaluated exactly the same as when we used a regular transformation rule. So we get all ones. And now when you use the rule delayed function, you evaluate the left hand side, but you don't evaluate the right hand side. You put in the unevaluated right hand side. So let me show you how that works. Here we're going to take again, we'll take a list of all ones and our transformation rule, which in this case is a rule delayed transformation rule. We have a random integer between zero and one going to either the first part of the ordered pair a B or the second part. Now, if this was just a regular rule so that we had just the arrow, what would happen is we would create a list of four ones and then we would have a rule that might be one goes to A or one goes to B. Okay. But in this case, we don't evaluate the right hand side. So what we're doing is we're replacing each one with a transformation rule, which is evaluated fresh. So for example, the first one is evaluated by taking a random integer from one to two. In this case, it'll be one. And that'll be the first part of the ordered pair AB. So we're taking AB, the first part for the first element. And then for all the other elements, when we run it, the right hand side of the transformation rule is evaluated each time we use it. Okay. And in this case, it happened to give us B for each time. So the first A here, the A in the list comes from doing a trans a evaluation of the right hand side. And all the other B's come from doing a new evaluation of the right hand side of the transformation rule as well. Okay. We'll show that again using another example where again, we start with a list of four ones and we use a rule delayed function. And in this case, the one that first appears is now evaluated by evaluating the right hand side of the transformation rule. And that gives us back B the second time it gives us back the first part of the ordered pair AB. So we get a, and the third time it happens to give back B and the fourth time it gives back a. So the reason that a different result is because the right hand side of the rule delayed function or that transformation rule isn't evaluated until after it's been substituted in to the evaluated expression. Okay. Finally, we have this example where we take again, a list of four ones and we use a rule delayed function and we get back four ones. So there's been no change made at all. And the question is, well, why haven't you made any change? 
The reason there's been no change made is that after we created the list of four ones, we evaluated the left-hand side of the transformation rule, and when we picked a random integer from zero to one, we must have picked zero. Because then we have zero, and then it doesn't matter what the right-hand side is, because there's no zero in the list of four ones, so that transformation rule isn't going to be used. Okay? Now, we can put a constraint on a transformation rule by placing a slash semicolon condition after the rule delayed transformation rule. And that restricts it in the same way that it restricts the use of a set delayed rewrite rule. Okay? Now, we can also apply a transformation rule over and over and over again. And the way we do that is we use a double slash period. Okay, if we were just using it one time, we would use a slash period, but to keep using it, we use a double slash. So here's an example of that. We have the list ABC, and we're going to use the transformation rule C goes to B and B goes to A. When we do that, we get AAA. So what's happened? Well, the first thing that's happened is that the Wolfram language evaluates the expression. And we don't have A, and we don't have B, and we don't have C in the rule base, so they stay the same. The evaluated expression is just the list ABC. Then we go to the transformation rules and we say, do we have a rewrite rule, or do we have a transformation rule for A? And the answer is no, we don't. So we just keep the first element to be A. Then we go to B and we say, do we have a transformation rule for changing B, and we look and we see, well, C goes to B doesn't work, but B goes to A is a transformation rule that we can use. So we use that, and we change the B in the evaluated expression to an A. Then we get to C, and we say, do we have a transformation rule for C? And well, we do. Here, C goes to B. But notice that what I get back is A, and the reason it goes to A is after it converts C to B using the transformation rule, it goes back and keeps looking at the transformation rules to see if there are any more that can be used. Remember I said that when you normally use a transformation rule, you're only allowed to make one change. But when you use a repeated transformation rule, you can keep making changes as long as that's possible. So in this case, what's happened is the evaluated C is first converted to B, and then the B is converted to A. And that's why you get a list which is all A's. Now, one thing which you want to note is that when you apply it, you take each value in the evaluated expression and you apply all the transformation rules you can until it doesn't change anymore. Then you go to the next part of the evaluated expression and you go through the list. So you don't change all parts at one time going through the list but you just change one part at a time as much as you can until you're done with it and then you go to the next part of the evaluated expression and you make as many changes as you can with that and so on. Okay, so let's summarize these functions. Let's summarize the set rule, the set delayed rule, the transformation rule or the rule and the set delayed transformation rule and here's how they work. When you set, when you write, the left-hand side is equal to the right-hand side, which means you're creating a set function, the right-hand side is evaluated. Remember, the left-hand side is not evaluated, okay? When you create a set delayed function, you don't evaluate either side. You just put the whole thing into the rule base, and that's never evaluated until you actually call that function with a given argument. Okay? When you use a transformation rule, the first thing you do is you evaluate the expression, and then normally, if you're using a rule transformation rule, that's with the caret, the left-hand side is evaluated and the right-hand side is evaluated before those transformation rules are used in the evaluated expression. When you use a rule delayed transformation rule, you first evaluate the expression, then you evaluate the left-hand side of the transformation rule, but you don't evaluate the right-hand side 
until after you use that transformation rule. And so this table basically summarizes the evaluation that's done when you enter one of these functions. And these are all user-defined functions, okay?